good evening to all the post graduates who have joined we are now starting the third round of this post graduate pg online pg teaching initiative uh, now we have finished squin retina glaucoma cornea and now we have cataract uvia and neuro ophthalmology uh, topics on which we have national faculty and they will be teaching all the post graduates today we have with us dr Kamaljit Singh, Professor Kamaljit Singh, Dr. Sujit Mishra, and Dr. Sagar Bhargav. Uh, Professor Kamaljit Singh is from Allahabad. Dr. Sujit Mishra is from Patna, and Dr. Sagar Bhargav is from Calcutta. Uh, Dr. Professor Kamaljit Singh will be speaking on anesthesia, and uh, Dr. Sujit Mishra and Dr. Sagar Bhargav will be speaking on biometry. We'll be starting from the basics and then moving on to the different topics in Canada. I would like to take this opportunity to introduce Professor Kamaljit Singh, who is the Professor and Head of the Department of Ophthalmology of MLN Medical College, which is also the Regional Institute of Ophthalmology uh, in Allahabad. We are very grateful to you, sir, for the time that you have given us and your blessing. Sir Thank has you. written a book on small incision cataract surgery, Manuel Feco. He was awarded the WHO Fellowship uh, uh, for Medical Retina Training, for which he went to USA for six weeks. And he trained at Philadelphia and in Boston. Sir has also Sir was also the president of the Intraocular Implant and Refractive Society in 2006. He was the vice president of the UP of Talmic Society in 2017. He was the past editor of the UP Journal of Ophthalmology, and he has performed live surgery demonstrations. He has been a guest speaker at national and international conferences. He has contributed in several research papers and he has given operations at IRSI, UP State and Bihar State. We are very grateful to you, sir. And Professor Kamaljit will be speaking on anesthesia in cataract surgery today. Professor Kamaljit, sir. Right. Thank you. Should I say a share now? Yes, yes sir. sir. Is it there? The slides are there? Uh, no, sir. As of now, it's not visible. Okay. Okay. Is it visible now? Uh, not at all, sir. Uh, same in the same manner, sir. You just need to click on that share icon and then click on that screen. Yes, I went the same way, but it's not coming. Sir, after clicking on share icon, you can see one micro window of screen. No, I can't see. Uh, then possibly, sir, there might be multiple windows open. Uh, now it is coming, sir. Yes, sir. Now it is visible. Okay. So, uh, good evening, everybody. It's a uh, pleasure to be with uh, Bihar again, and Dr. Satsal Sinha is doing a wonderful job. This is uh, such an important topic, and many a time we forget to read this and understand this topic. Actually, when uh, we were uh, students, we were always uh, bothered about this injection because at our time, we used to have this... Uh, Retrobulbar injection. And our professors used to. Am I audible? Hello? Hello? Yes, sir, you're audible, sir. Okay, okay. So our professor used to say that to give this just one, millimeter, one milliliter of uh, injection in the retrobulbar space, and there was one 
Professor Shirvasto used to say that give just 0.5 to 0.75 ml, and we never knew how could he um, do justice with that little amount, giving just 0.5 millimeter milliliter. And he used to just show us how to give this properly. And in his hands, it was absolutely 100% right. Although it's a blind procedure, so that was the time, and um, the. Basically, I would like to just share a little bit about the eyeball. You can see this is uh, the, it is the orbit is placed like this, and eyeball is the axis is goes like this. So it's about 45 degrees on this side, and uh, there are various spaces that we have to understand. And uh, the optic nerve you can see goes like this. If you have a mid sagittal section, it goes slightly medially. So you have to be very careful uh, while um, uh, giving injection, and uh, there are various spaces that you should know about. I'll just a little bit about that. The uh, most important is this uh, muscle cone that we talk about most of the time while giving retrobulbar injections, which goes within this. And if the needle goes like this, it hits the optic nerve, then you will have. Injury to the optic nerve. So this was the optic. Uh, this retrobulbar injection was given behind the eyeball, so it was called retrobulbar injection. And peribulbar is when we give give it in the extraconal space. This was intraconal space. This is extraconal space. And there you give, then it is called uh, peribulbar. And para parabulbar injection is also given, which is being used these days by most of the Europeans. Most of the time they give. Uh, Parabulbar or subtenon injection that we can say, so that is given, which is very very useful in uh, obtaining the akinesia and anesthesia in the local area. So we'll discuss that later, but basically we have to understand where the these spaces. So once again, I would like to tell you that uh, this is the parabulbar uh, area, this is the peribulbar area. And this is this. So you can see that the muscles don't come in between your injection and the muscles. Uh, so for the retrobulbar injection, you have to go penetrate this area and go through the muscle into the uh, this space so that your ciliary ganglion gets blocked. So this is basically I wanted to discuss with uh, you all about the spaces and. and uh, So how did this came about this uh, anesthesia? Actually, I was reading a little bit about uh, this, how this anesthesia came. So I came to know that in the year 1884, the this uh, topical anesthesia was given. So it was caller who uh, showed the trick that if you put cocaine into the eye of the animal, or the guinea pig, then you find that it goes onto the surface of the cornea and you can do any surgery. After waiting for some time, you can do even a deep uh, surgery into the eye and the reflexes also go away from the animal eye. And then he used it in himself in 1884 and his friends, these cocaine drops he used and found that it was very, very effective. So before this, there was no anesthesia. And people used to operate, and our teachers used to tell us that in the past the surgery was done by holding the two eyelids uh, tightly, and the surgeon used to operate. And he always said that this is the operation we are going to do, and we are going to do it. If you have closed your eyes, then your vision will be gone, it will be permanent. And if you have closed uh, so it was just by chance that many used to get some uh, vision because they used to do with the knife and they used to remove the lens. So that was done without anesthesia and today again the circle has come back and uh, we say that uh, the, uh, the topical anesthesia or no anesthesia was used in the past before 1884. And later on, this retrobulbar and peribulbar came when we started uh, using this anesthesia, which came very late. And then the surgery became foolproof. 
so now people are doing with topical anesthesia many uh, surgeons advocate no anesthesia also so there are various techniques of anesthesia you can have a general anesthesia which is re not usually required in cataract surgery unless there is uh, pediatric cataract surgery that we do under local anesthesia we come with the topical anesthesia and regional anesthesia the topical anesthesia is a preferred technique these days by the uh, ophthalmic surgeons because of the advent of the phacoemulsification and so we can do phacoemulsification easily under topical and um, it's because the surgery is very well controlled and uh, if the patient is really cooperative then you can do with this but in many of the high volume centers people prefer parabulbar block uh, this uh, sorry uh, peribulbar block is preferred this is the first preference in our hospital we do around 100 to 150 cases uh, day and in that uh, the resident keeps on giving peribulbar block and hardly we see any complications sometimes there could be chymosis or a little bit of subcondent travel average but otherwise it's a very good anesthesia to give that two bulbar block is now almost obsolete Subtenon block is being used right and left by the Europeans and they use it quite often because after putting the topical anesthesia they give this injection and they can do the job. Intracameral is required when you do a, a topical anesthesia surgery then sometimes uh, you need to inject the topical anesthesia inside the eye which is um, uh, free of any uh, storage device. So that is given inside and you use that. Facial block uh, was given when uh, we used to do ret uh, retrobulbar block in which you could uh, uh, attain the echinacea and the uh, anesthesia in the eyeball. But today now we have uh, this uh, facial block is almost obsolete. It's hardly required. So the frontal block is required for tosis surgery and other surgeries. So basically for cataract surgery, two uh, choices are there. One is the parabulbar and the other one is uh, peribulbar. These are commonly used and topical is also very common. So we can do uh, SICS or decomulsification under topical. Both surgeries can be done without any problem. So this can be done easily without any problem. Now, so local anesthesia, these are the uh, surgeries, uh, pterygium, cataract, uh, minor, extraocular, keratoplasty, etc. These are all done under local anesthesia, even vitreoretinal surgery, a long surgery that is there. So we, we can add up to the uh, basic uh, injection that has been given if you need to give more time to the surgery. So that can be added. So this is where we use the local anesthesia. And general anesthesia is especially in squint surgery and pediatric surgery, as I already mentioned, and orbital tumor uh, repair, sometimes in retinal surgery also this may be required. Then uh, local anesthesia, uh, the greatest uh, important thing is that the patient is uh, conscious and uh, he maintains mental alertness. And we always tell our residents to not to talk while uh, the surgery is being is being done because many a times oh ah all these uh, sounds they create a lot of trouble to the patient and uh, post operatively even if you have done a very good surgery the, there is a big advantage of this anesthesia that patient remembers each and every sound that is in place inside the operation theater so that is there and we have to uh, avoid that um, then we have the risk of nausea and vomiting sometimes and uh, the advantage is that uh, early mobilization can be done in these patients. The disadvantage is that the patient can get some pain while giving the injection. So many a time that after giving a uh, peribulbar injection, the other was operated under topical. So he said that uh, when the parable, uh, this peribulbar injection was given, then we did not have, uh, I did not, I could not see rather anything. And uh, there was no worry while the surgery was being done. But in 
topical anesthesia he said that i was so much worried because i could see all the scissors and blades and phaco emulsification machine going inside my eye and i was in deep uh, anxiety at that time so this was a very senior anesthetist who told us that these are the differences between the two techniques topical and local anesthesia so many would prefer uh, local anesthesia still so uh, the the desired properties that we have is that it should be non toxic and non irritating and there should be a potency of uh, anesthetic agents and there should not be any side effect like nerve damage or necrosis so in some of the techniques like in uh, retrobulbar injection we get uh, even optic atrophy in some of the um, cases now before undertaking the patient for surgery you have to ask some very very important questions which we many a time miss and the most important thing is about taking detail history diabetes hypertension etc has to be taken care of apart from that blood thinner and antiplatelet platelet um, uh, drugs whether he is taking or not should also be taken because many a times there is a there is bleeding when you are giving peribulbar or retrobulbar injection or even parabulbar injection so that comes but these days since we are doing topical many surgeons don't prefer stopping the blood thinners like we when we give uh, injections we uh, stop the uh, antiplatelets or blood thinners 3 days prior to 3 to 5 days prior to the surgery but here what happens that we these days uh, many surgeons don't stop because there are some complications that can occur but we have always stopped my personal experience is that we have always stopped the blood thinners and have found that there is no um, problem in that none of the patient had any episode of cardiovascular kind in our patients so that is there and uh, so local anesthesia you have two groups ester groups which are these and they have um, more uh, complications and these lidocaine bupivacaine and ropi these are the recent ones the amide group and uh, mostly we use lidocaine and bupivacaine in our setup this is another drug which has come in india again ropivacaine so that can also be used with this and uh, the commonly loads, uh, used uh, anesthesia is a combination of lidocaine and bupivacaine one one is to one or one is to two can be used to 2 ml of uh, lidocaine and 3 ml of uh, sorry uh, uh, 3 ml of lidocaine and 2 ml of bupivacaine can be used and uh, this is mixed with uh, our what is what do you call halorodo is is uh, given inside so that you have a good diffusion of the uh, this local anesthetic around the eyeball and so that the result is obtained faster the results last uh, to about 2 uh, to 3 hours with this technique so we can do any kind of surgery with this so as i have already discussed the this is topical anesthesia is cost effective least invasive set procedure no compression is required so whereas in peribulbar and retrobulbar after giving the injection you need to give compression so so that it diffuses properly and tension also goes down after the compression so that can be used the effect of anesthesia under topical is immediate you don't need to wait whereas in the other kinds you have to wait for 5 to 10 minutes and then you can proceed with the surgery this advantage is that there is no an akinesia patient might squeeze and you may be in trouble and uh, uh, only experienced surgeons those who have been doing under topical they can do this surgery others have to learn for some time so the patient can be anxious if he is not cooperative then you have to resort to many a times to general anesthesia also so the iv line should be maintained in these cases also so one prick has to be given in your arm also which is avoided in the eye for which patients are fearful and uh, many a times we say that um, we don't give any injection but all the injections have to be given in the hand perhaps that could be the right thing then um, there are uh, toxicity of the local topical anesthesia that you have put on the eye there could be a surface keratopathy in some of the cases in the past people used to use 4% zalocaine for giving the anesthesia now this topical uh, anesthesia is available which gives you instant effect and 2 to 3 minutes prior if you put this 
there would be no problem so that is there so topical anesthesia cataract surgery can be done i don't need to go into the other details and uh, so this we have already discussed and the other way of giving topical anesthesia is by using a uh, soaked sponges which i do in small incision cataract surgery we put soaked sponges on uh, just close to place where you are going to give the incision for say 2 minutes and the effect is wonderful you can do topical uh, surgery with this technique also uh, the fecal emulsification and uh, sics both can be easily done with this technique so then regional anesthesia as i have already mentioned that these drugs have to be used and 3 ml of lignocaine 2 ml of this and some halvan uh, dose the basic uh, practical guideline is that you give one injection of halvan dose into the xylocaine 30 uh, ml and then you mix it uh, properly shake it and so that the effect lasts uh, properly and then you adrenaline adrenaline these days people don't use because the surgery is very short this is required only when you are going to perform a longer surgery and it should be avoided in those patients who are hypertensive so that should also be avoided so retrovulvar block is injected as i have already mentioned that it goes in the muscle cone and it it used to have a long needle you must not have seen these the young uh, residents they must not have seen this technique it used to be 26 gauge needle which was a blind procedure of course but many a times you had to get Uh, red to bulbar hemorrhage in this because the uh, needle used to go through the septum and through the muscle cone into the uh, this is central space and uh, this was the thing and many a times the effect was not good but once the effects used to come the ciliary ganglions were blocked properly third and sixth cranial nerve then the effect was good and the surgery could be performed without because the amount of injection was very little so the pressure rise was also very little so there was no problem in surgery those days intracapsular surgery was performed uh, and was a very good technique in the hands of uh, uh, our senior surgeons so here i don't need to mention it because you all are not giving in the peribulbar injection you give 2 to 4 ml uh, of uh, injection and you Give, this is the retrovulvar you go in the muscle cone and the direction is given for retrovulvar but in peribulbar you go in this area only so you need to have a shorter uh, uh, needle you can do even with the 26 gauge needle and that is the process that can be adopted for uh, peribulbar injection so these are the complications of retrovulvar injection which i don't need to mention so it has been almost uh, obsolete now and this is how you give at the 2/3 and 1/3 junction in the past people used to say that you look up and in today if they say that you look straight because if you look up and in then your optic nerve comes closer to your needle and might get an injury there so the peribulbar block is injected into peribulbar space as i have already mentioned and uh, it spreads to lid and other spaces it, it is just the local uh, effect on the muscles and around that it uh, goes and does the job and there is no need of facial block in the retrovulvar block you used to give facial block also so here we don't need it because you give in a large volume of 5 to 10 ml so it goes inside and diffuses properly and blocks everything and you get good echinacea and anesthesia so that is there so the technique was that you give one injection in the lower uh, site about 2/3 to 1/3 uh, uh, at that point at the junction of that you give this injection and once you have given then you give into the superior site so in the superior side you go in the nasal side superior nasal side and give this injection you go straight here in the lower side also you don't need to just deviate from one side to other side and uh, you can give 5 to 6 ml here and many a times residents when the effect does not give come they give even more but it is not advised if you give 
these days what we have done is that if the uh, you give one injection only and the trick is that uh, you first up, uh, put some uh, paracaine drops into the conjunctival sac and just a little bit of uh, topical this thing apply some ointment uh, xylocaine jelly on the lid so when you give the injection there is no prick felt by the patient so there is no pain to the patient anything that no injection has been given because you have a competition with those who are doing topical anesthesia and many a times as a beginner you would need to do these tricks so these are the tricks sometimes applied with our patients so that they don't get pain and the hallmark of any surgery is no pain analgesia is more important patients anxiety should be should not be there otherwise with the pain patient many a times feels a little worrisome and your surgery might go away so that is there and uh, apart from this you the disadvantages only are that you get conjunctival chemosis and uh, echinacea is less than the retrovulvar block but the advantage is that you don't get any perforation of the eye with the perifulbar needle and you don't need uh, to go into the inside uh, you don't perforate the eye ball so it does not go inside the eye optic nerve injury also goes much less and intrathecal uh, this thing uh, injection does not go there and uh, so and there is no many a times hematoma occurs which is not there in uh, peribulbar block so these are all advantages of uh, peribulbar so this is most preferred technique in our setup and uh, parabulbar is being used very frequently in the european society and these surgeons what they do is that they give a snip in the inferotemporal conjunctiva after putting some topical drops and with a cannula they inject the dye into the Mm, inject the anesthetic into the uh, subtenon space you go close to the uh, uh, keep the cannula straight and you remain parallel to the optic nerve slowly you have to inject this uh, local anesthetic and uh, take care that you don't use a, a sharp edge needle although many uh, people do with that also but a cannula is a very good technique so that you don't perforate it the eyeball so this is a very good technique being used very commonly uh, in the western world and uh, no compression is required in this the important thing here is that no compression of the eye is required which is done in peribulbar and retrobulbar injection so that is there and the effect is very rapid uh, compared with the topical so and it stays also for very long period the only problem is that you might get a subcanning travel hemorrhage and uh, so that can be there the eye becomes red and the patients might say ki saab hamari aankh lal ho rahi hai so patient is more bothered about the redness of the eye than the vision so that can be there so that is why peribulbar is preferred by us frontal block is required for supra these are uh, for stosis surgery so i don't need to discuss all this and uh, facial nerve block two blocks this can be asked in question they are there so there are 3 uh, to 5 ml is used and there are two techniques that we use wall lin technique and o'brien technique these are the two common techniques that we use for giving facial block and what we do in this um, classic wall lin is that we go just on the lateral orbital margin about 1 mm we have done all this but maybe many a times you all are not required to do this injection but you should know about this technique also sometimes it may be needed so you just give um, about 1 mm behind the lateral orbital uh, angle they from there 1 uh, cm behind that you take the needle and go in the uh, lower side in the inferior 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 orbital rim side and the superior orbital rim side and uh, so uh, that gives quite anesthesia and the modified is that you give in this side this side also and on the inferior side also so this gives you a good uh, orbicularis block which means that you don't get any squeezing effect there while doing the surgery which is not required in uh, peribulbar uh, surgery so many a times this is not needed o'brien technique is another technique wherein we use it into the mandible 
just one milli uh, one centimeter below the temporomandibular joint, you take this needle, and uh, you have to feel the temporomandibular joint by asking the patient to close and uh, open the mouth, so you can feel the temporomandibular joint. And one centimeter beneath that, you go and inject it into the condyle. So there was a joke in the past. We used to always, I used to teach that there was a first year resident who came. He said, sir, I want to give what is there in giving this injection. So the senior resident told that you, what you do is that you take the needle. It's very easy. You go there, you'll feel the bone. And uh, with that, you go inside the temporal mandibular joint. There you feel the bony thing and you just inject the, the effect will come in short time. So he went for the other surgery and when he came back, he found that patient was what this resident did was that he took this needle and went, did not feel the temporomandibular joint and just anterior to that he went and pushed it into the tooth of the patient and patient just um, puked this whole xylocaine 5 ml that was given by him. So this can happen many a time. So you have to initially learn this technique also. After moving the um, uh, mouth, ask the patient to move the jaw so that uh, you, you can exactly locate this point and give injection to the orbicularis because uh, facial nerve takes a round here and you can easily uh, block the facial nerve so that can be easily blocked. So these are various techniques that can be used and uh, local infiltration for lacrimal sac surgery is also done. There are uh, this complications can occur in sometimes retrovulvar hemorrhage used to occur and we have seen our seniors while giving injections suddenly the eye starts protruding anteriorly and you get this kind of picture the whole eye becomes black and the surgery is postponed eyeballs are closed so this is what uh, has to be done if you get a peribulbar block the uh, the lids become tight in the initial uh, point then this whole eyeball starts protruding so that is a complication so that has to be done and once it occurs then you have to look at the fundus you see whether there is because of the pressure there is central retinal artery occlusion is it occurred or not so you give acetazolamide etc close the eye and ask the patient to come back again and uh, look at this properly sometimes even can thought me may be required if the pressure is too much so that is the complications with that Blow perforation I have already discussed and we have seen in my 30, 35 years career in ophthalmology, I have seen one injection only which went inside the eyeball by a new resident. Otherwise, I have not seen this complication occurring usually. There are many places, sometime we'll discuss, um, uh, it can go into the sclera, it can go inside the eye or it may remain just suppending travel this injection. So those three, four places are there and how can you diagnose it? it suddenly the eye becomes hypotonus and the patient gets lots of pain. So you know that something wrong has happened there and the surgery becomes problematic. Optic nerve injury I have discussed several times in course of my lecture. So that can be there. Then muscle palsy is also there. It's not sight threatening, but uh, tosis is quite common with these injections. So mild tosis can postoperatively occur. Sometimes patient may complain of diplopia. It goes away usually with passage of time. And uh, so all those complications are. The biggest complication is when you go with a needle there, you go inside the optic nerve sheath and uh, you see the, you have gone inside there and you can puncture the sheath and it can go through the meninges into the brain and the brain stem anesthesia can occur and patient may even have these problems, hemorrhosis, drowsiness, confusion, all these things start occurring and even may lose consciousness. So all these things can be there with retrobulbar, which is avoided with peribulbar. So you have to be careful, don't inject it into the arteries and don't inject it into the suppending table, uh, this thing. Otherwise, if the eye becomes red, then the patient is in problem. So those uh, complications are there. You must have your uh, anesthetist handy always while you are performing surgery because he's going to tackle the things there. Then oculocardiac reflex is another thing that is very common with this. These are the efferent pathways. 
and uh, through these uh, ciliary ganglion trigeminal it goes into the uh, this floor of the medulla and from there the efferents come and through the vagus nerve it uh, goes into the heart and uh, there is uh, this oculocardiac reflex you suddenly get bradycardia so you must have a hand on the pulse to look whether the patient is getting any uh, bradycardia in these patients or not so this can be there and uh, so the surgery need to be stopped in some times so that may be there which has not occurred uh, with us any time but convulsions yes we have seen once and you have need to give uh, sedation and which is given by the uh, anesthetist atropine should always be handy with you but that may be required uh, to have a Mm, good effect uh, so that uh, the bradycardia goes away so these are the references the most important thing is that uh, how it began is important caller uh, did it under topical in animals then put the drops in his own eye and finally this we have come to the topical anesthesia today and still peribulbar and parabulbar injection is usually being given and many a times you are asked these questions thank you so much for your um, silent listening to this talk thank you so much <laughs> <laughs> thank you Th thank you so much sir thank you so much for the wonderful amazing comprehensive talk that you have given on uh, anesthesia uh, for the postgraduate which is something very important uh, I, i i would just like to add a few points uh, it's very important for the postgraduates to remember to take a consent from the patient before you are giving these uh, injections uh, because uh, regardless of how perfect one is uh, any complication can happen at any time though as sir said these complications are very rare if you are very careful if you have listened to this talk carefully and if you know uh, how to give this injection exactly then you will have very least complications uh, also when you have a retrobulbar hemorrhage Uh, on the table before you are starting the surgery uh, you will feel that the eyeball has become very hard and that is the time you should realize that something has gone wrong um like sir said in his 35 years he has seen only one case uh, of uh, globe perforation but it is written in the book also and it is a documented complication uh, one of the things that you might see is that you might lose the uh, if there is a red reflex you will lose the red reflex because there may be vitreous hemorrhage and you will not see the red reflex uh, it is also very important that uh, when you are doing on a one eyed patient especially during your post graduation and almost 5 to 6 years till you have uh, mastered the technique when you are doing on a one eyed patient you want to make sure that uh, you give uh, a peribulbar anesthesia uh, before doing this cataract surgery i would really like to thank professor kamaljit singh for the amazing talk that he has given for the post graduates thank you so much sir uh, you, for your sir. talk and time today thank you so thank much you. sir if we have any questions from the post graduates we will take it in the end of this session sir thank i would you. now like to welcome our second speaker for today dr sagar bhargav once you have given the anesthesia it's important that you go ahead and start doing the surgery and the most important thing that you will be doing is putting the intraocular lens now no matter how good a surgeon you become and if you have put the wrong biometry uh, if you have put the wrong iul power and the patient is not able to see properly he is not going to be happy seeing what kind of a incision you have made or what kind of a beautiful uh, left peco time you had etc etc uh, so biometry is one of the most important thing in cataract surgery and which is why we have divided it into two parts one is a plain and simple regular biometry and one is in special situations uh, where we have to do biometry so uh, in normal conditions the dr sagar bhargav uh, dr sujit mishra will be talking and in special situations dr sagar bhargav will be talking uh, dr sagar bhargav will be talking on special situation so i would like to talk welcome dr sujit mishra now uh, for biometry in routine cases dr sujit mishra is a fellow from arvind eye hospital He is the ex consultant and CMO from Lotus Eye Hospital and Institute at Tamil Nadu. He has received his FICO in cataract and FICO. He has done the ICO course, basic and clinical sciences. He has presented many free papers, instruction courses, posters, 
talks and international and national and state level conferences. Um, he is the instructor for biometry at AIOC uh, regularly, and he runs the Sunetra High Hospital in Patna. So people who have seen uh, uh, Three Idiots will know that there was a small boy called Millimeter, and uh, Sujit Mishra in popularly in Bihar is known as the biometer uh, of biometry in Bihar. So he is very good with the subject, and I would like to request um, all the postgraduates to listen very carefully to the tips that he has to give. Dr. Sujit Mishra, please. Thank you, Dr. Sachadit, sir, for this kind introduction. It's a pleasure sharing screen with Dr. Kamaljit, sir, and my fellow Dr. Shagar uh, Bhargosh. I hope my slides are visible. Yes, it is. Doing good FACO will give you a quiet eye, but doing Can good biometry will give you the wow effect. Sujit, can we make it full screen? I have made it full screen, sir. Here we are seeing uh, your slideshow, please. Uh, slideshow. Is it visible? It is visible, but you'll have to click on slideshow. It's there on the right hand side, bottom. No, the routine one I have done that. Oh, then why is it showing in here? Is it coming now? No, we can just see your multiple slides on the left and uh, your main slide in the middle. Uh, so you are operating this with a MacBook or Windows? Windows it is. Okay. Can you help me out? Um, Manish? Yes, sir, ideally in Windows it should happen. Uh, then probably it depends. I didn't use the little bit. Oh, I know how to put slide i have i know how to put slideshow i have put it no, no i understand sir but probably but the bandwidth might not be allowing it so what we can do alternately then uh, if in case slideshow is not happening uh, Rick, means for the viewers it is not visible so we can minimize it so you can see top or left hand side there is a cross mark where the slides and the outline is here there is a slight cross mark so the visibility will improve, sir. Uh, I'm audible, sir. Yeah, I have uh, done it full yes, screen. Sir. I have done it full screen. No issue, sir. You can minimize that. Uh, you can es escape from the uh, full screen. OK. And then in, on the top left hand side, there is a slide uh, where we have the slide sorters outline. There is a small cross. No, no, sir, down, sir. There is a small cross just near to slide one, slide number one. Can you see, sir? Which side? Uh, on the top left hand side, um, where the slide number one is there. There is a uh, small yeah. cross mark. Okay. You can, you can click on that cross. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And now double click on home button, sir. Home button, double click. Has it come now? No. Uh, 
slightly better sir you can double click on home tab sir actually this macbook pro is there any number and function oh, you are doing from macbook sir yeah no 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 means uh, this uh, notebook not mac uh, this is notebook okay. okay this is asus notebook so in okay. functions can you tell me which one which number functions uh yes sir so function uh, sujit yeah. why don't you uh, sw switch off your computer and log in again and try it again in the meanwhile we'll uh, do the question answer session with professor kamaljeet sir yeah yeah, yeah please uh, professor kamaljeet sir you are there yes sir i am there sir one question is sir uh, what can cause oculo cardiac reflex this occurs because of the pulling of the muscles during surgery if you pull it uh, especially in rd surgery and spine surgeries it suddenly pulls yes, the pulling of the muscles too much that causes especially the medial ventus sir what is the use of bupi vacain it's long acting it's it, it it stays there for long and the kinesia and the anesthesia stays for long whereas uh, the other one that uh, the zalocaine the effect does not come uh, does not stay for long although the effect of zalocaine comes earlier than the bupivacaine so if you give it in combination the effect lasts for longer and you can easily do your surgery whatever surgery you want for a long time especially with the young surgeon it's very very advisable that you do it with this sir how much is the ideal amount that we should give in local anesthesia and will more than 10 ml cause cardiotoxicity the actually if you go intra arterial then the cardiotoxicity is more and uh, the uh, required anesthesia that the ideal amount is around 5 ml so what we do is that we give in one uh, area only in the lower orbital floor in that side if you go then i don't advise these days to go on the upper side and if you wait for some time the effect comes very fast with 4 to 5 ml anesthesia and you can do cataract surgery easily so what is the difference between lateral cantotomy and cantholysis i know about the cantotomy which is done with the artery forceps on the lateral side and you put it for some time and then you cut the canthus so the pressure effect goes i have not done cantholysis if you any any other person has any idea you can tell about that we'll take it sir uh, so jeet you are there yeah is it visible now that full screen is not coming you can continue with this also this small screen is not bad uh, i think you can go ahead with this uh, we'll lose time otherwise okay so basically when we started as a post graduate biometry meant measuring keratometry measuring corneal power axial length and putting into uh -huh. ir calculating formula Sir, just a minute, sir. So this is Manish. Yeah. So yeah. if we can, uh, you can adjust the screen size, sir. It's a very magnified view, so entire content is not visible. Uh, you can adjust this to eighty percent from down. Okay. Eighty percent, and okay. that uh, uh, cross mark you can do, sir. Again, that cross click, so that will be better. Eighty percent. It is eighty percent now. Yeah. Okay. And now make it full. Uh, no sir uh, if in case full screen is not happening you can just click on that cross button on the top left it shift oh, plus cross, uh, cross button is not there anyway it means it's in okay no issue simultaneously uh, yeah put shift plus f5 f5 shift plus f5 f5 yeah try that the slide show will work Yeah, so this is the maximum I can get. Uh, you need to share the screen again, sir. It's a uh, stop shared.
Yeah, fine, sir. Okay. So, as a postgraduate, biometry mean measuring corneal power, measuring axial length, and putting it into IUL power calculating formula and get the IUL power to implant and get emetropia. As we grew, we started measuring white to white anterior chamber depth and lens thickness. And with advent of toric and multifocal and uh, toric multifocal IULs, many more parameters were taken into considerations. And now we have cataract suits like Callisto I, Varion, intraoperative aberrometry. But basically, to understand few basics, you need to have a sound idea of keratometry, axial length measurement, and IUL power uh, calculation formulas. So coming to keratometry, from just measuring K readings, the understanding of cornea has changed over period of time. So we talk about simulated K, true K, and now with advent of IL Master 700, we are talking about TK. It come to uh, it later on. So for keratometry, what all options do we have? Manual, automated, Optical, we have topographer, we have shine flow, imaging system. So basically why all these things are needed? Because keratometry is an assumption. We assume it to be a perfect spherocylinder with fixed anterior to posterior corneal surface ratio, which is manifested at Gull-Strands ratio. And a refractive index is modified from 1.376 to 1.3375. So this lies beneath the assumption. Now, when we are measuring with different machines, we need to remember that we are measuring different areas of cornea, like IOL master will be measuring central 2.5 millimeter ring, manual keratometer will be measuring 3.2, lens star measurement will be 2.35 millimeter and 1.65 millimeter, like that various machines will measure. So what I want to convey to you is that you should not keep comparing different values because areas measured are different. Now you look at this one. When I tried to measure this cornea with manual keratometer, it was not possible to get a reading because that covers larger area. But I could get a reading with auto K. Also in keratometry, we measure few points and extrapolate it to non-measured areas, which are blind spots, and posterior corneal surface remains unmeasured. In IUL Master 700, TK, what we have done? With telecentric keratometry, we are measuring anterior surface. With swept source OCT technology, we are measuring posterior surface, and central corneal thickness is taken into account to calculate the corneal power. Now, coming to the ground level, you will come across the manual keratometer as your resident. So few basic things you have to keep in mind. The machine should be calibrated and you have to focus the eyepiece. Two images on left side, you can see the blur cross and on right side, you can see the focused cross. Now, what will happen if it is not calibrated? So this is K reading of one of my staff. I purposely defocused on plus and minus sides. Okay, so when it was focused, the reading was 42.75 diopters, and on defocusing on other side, either sides, the value changed to 43.5 and 42.25. So with this, you can understand how much important is calibration and proper focusing. Then keratometry should be done before any contact procedure and axial length measurement, and it should be done for both eyes. When you are uh, taking measurement, remember the silver colored metallic marker, the uh, arrow is there. Uh, that should be placed at the level of outer canthus. That will help you in aligning the myers centrally. And then from outside, you should look at the bright ring, whether it is positioned in central cornea or not. It is advisable to re-measure both eyes if K value is less than 40 or more than 47. This doesn't mean at all that values may not be 
correct if it is less or more than this, but you should be more careful because there may be other things lying behind. If there is difference in corneal cylindrical power of more than one diopter between eyes, you should be careful and the corneal cylinder should match refraction. Then there are many sources of error that may creep into the system like unfocused eyepiece as I told you, dry eye, poor fixation, excessive tears, droopy lids like that. So many factors are there, modifiable factors which you should keep in mind. Coming to axial length measurement, it is very important to identify where you are positioned in terms of the gadgets you are having. You may be in a position where you are doing contact biometry or maybe you have highest version available in your setup. So there are two options, broad categories to measure axial length. One is ultrasound biometry, other is optical biometry. Ultrasound will have either contact or immersion. Contact method easier, cheaper. There is corneal compression, abrasion is there and it is less accurate in short eyes because what you are doing, compressing the cornea. So in shorter eyes, those errors will be exaggerated. Immersion, it is better than contact method, always better. It is more accurate, a little bit cumbersome. Optical biometer, it is order of the day. So many equipments are available. Gradually, I proceed in my talk. I will try to give you overview. We have IL Master 500, 700, Lenstar, Aladdin, Tome, all sorts of things are there. Definitely it is more accurate. It is non-contact. It is easy to operate fast. Disadvantage, the biggest disadvantage is cost. So if your pocket allows, it is the best. Then hazy media. And where fixation is a problem in those situations, it has limitations. So the message conveyed is, even if you own optical biometer, it doesn't mean you have to discard your ultrasound biometry. There are four situations in ultrasound biometry where contact still you may need. One is if you don't have optical biometer to cross check your value in very, very dense cataract, in very long axial length eyes and very narrow palpebral aperture cases where you cannot fix Prager shell. So the principles of ultrasound biometry, what it does? The piezoelectric crystals are there. When, when current passes on it, it vibrates, sends the uh, sound wave. It will go hit the various surfaces of eye. It will come back, received by the probe, and it uh, these interactions will be reflected in the form of spikes. So you have to know in detail about these spikes of a scan. Now, if you look at the left side, a scan picture and right side a scan picture. The right one has one more extra spike, the first one. It is from the probe and it is by immersion method because that is uh, not in contact with cornea. So the first spike will be from the probe. There are features of a scan spike. Five principal eco spikes are from cornea, anterior lens, posterior lens capsule, retina, sclerine, or vital pad of fat. Eco heights should be optimum. Anterior lens eco should be 90%. 90% of what? If we assume the eco from cornea is 100%, then the length, then the spike eco from anterior lens capsule should be 90% or more. Posterior lens eco should lie between 50 to 75 percent and retina, uh, retina eco should be 75 percent or more. The takeoff should be sharp. It should be 90 degree. As uh, uh, these are shown in, in uh, this picture, you can read in books, it is there. Now, if you look at this picture, uh, the axial length in first one is 23.87. Second one 23.85 and third one 23.63. It is from the same eye by different observers, but if it is visible, you can look at the last one. There you will see 
that the orbital pad of fat and uh, uh, that uh, orbital pad of fat uh, spikes are absent. I, I'm not sure whether it is visible in this slide. So basically it was focused over optic nerve head. So it was uh, like that. Then there are certain modifiable parameters uh, in, in a scan that is gain, gates and TGC. I will show you about the gain. The first one when I for the above picture, if you see uh, the spikes are broader. So gain was set at 80%. So gain 80% high gain means the system is more sensitive. It will pick up even the smaller strength spikes. So it is uh, broader spikes. When I reduce the gain to 70%, now you see the spikes width has come down. So it is ideal to record the uh, best scan at minimum gain. So that will give you more accuracy. Now gates, I have a beautiful example to show you on gates. These are the arrowheads that you are uh, seeing. And, and, and place where it is placed based on that, it will measure different segments of eye. I will show you a beautiful example. This is a mature cataract. And now this is the scan. Uh, if, if you see closely, uh, the, uh, the first one where no arrowhead is, that is from probe, this is immersion technique. The first arrowhead is lying on cornea. The second spike, ideally it should be from anterior lens capsule, but anterior, but arrowhead is lying on the third spike. So what is that? In mature cataract center, central core nucleus that is dense, that is also going, giving one extra spike. So machine is not able to identify between anterior lens capsule and the spike from central core nucleus. So it has falsely placed itself uh, there. So what I did, I manually dragged that uh, second arrowhead back to anterior lens capsule and uh, then in this you can see I have, I have changed that arrowhead and what it made it it changed the axial length from 23.35 to 24.44 so even if your machine is not uh, giving you accurate measurement if you have an idea of the qualities of a scan spikes you can manipulate yourself to maximize the outcome of same of uh, same ultrasound biometer so there lies the importance of knowing in and out of biometry. Then you have a scan data validated, validation. You have to remeasure both eyes if axial length is less than 22 millimeter or more than 25 millimeter in either eye. The difference between two eyes is more than 0.3 mm and axial length doesn't match refraction. If you are repeating and you if you have other option available to measure, other person available to take biometry, take help of him. Now, uh, this is important uh, in case of optical biometry. In, in manual, I showed you all the details, but in optical biometry, just like autoref, instantaneously it will take all the readings. So how you will know whether it is correct or not? So to know the validated, uh, validation of the data is captured, you have to look at the standard deviation of the captured values. So for axial length, standard deviation of the measured value should lie within 0.05 mm. Difference between two eyes, same 0.33 mm. Standard deviation of K reading in diopters should be less than 0.2 diopters. And standard deviation of meridians of astigmatism should be less than 3.5 degrees. Now, if you look at this underlined 6.5 degree, for astigmatism. So even if it is captured by optical biometer, we will not take this value and remeasure it. And unless it comes within 3.5 degrees, that data will not be valid. Others I have told earlier. So for optical biometer, we have a lot of options. Signal to noise ratio will also tell you about the validity of the data. What you have to know about this uh, optical biometer is that the initial one came with time domain and in between we didn't go for a spectral domain directly we switched to swift source OCT which is which technology is present in IL Master 700. I would like to give you an overview of uh, the prototypes that evolved. 
laser interferometry used two different uh, modules. One was partial coherence interferometry, which was there in IL Master 500. It used multi-mode laser diode at 780 nanometer. And the lens star used optical low coherence reflectometry, which uses superluminescent diode at 820 nanometer. Now, in, in IL Master 500, the, each peak measurement is followed by secondary maximum on either side. So it complicates the spike and its uh, interpretation. Whereas in SLD, the measurement is just like a scan. So there will be only one spike from the area you are measuring. So you get more like a scan uh, values. Now, this is interesting thing that in IL Master 500, you don't get lens thickness, whereas in lens star, you get lens thickness. So what is the basic reason for this? The consultant for IL Master was Hague's and Hague's formula doesn't mean lens thickness. Whereas in Paulson formula, why this coming sound is coming? Whereas in lens star, Paulson formula, lens thickness is required, so lens star will measure lens thickness. IL Master 700, it's like a cross section scan across the eye and it gives you all the desired values. So it fills all the gaps, the lacunae they were, which were present earlier. And when you are using optical biometer, it is very important for you to understand ULIB, which is user group of laser interference biometry. This will give you a separate set of A constants, which are uh, used for IL power calculation. Remember, the A constant, which are present on normal lens packets, they are based on ultrasound biometry. That is the way biometry evolved. So when we have optical biometer, the corresponding A constants will be present on this ULIB, which is available free online. Now for IL power formulas, broadly you can categorize into derivation based or evolution as per generations. On deriv derivation based, it can be theoretical or a regression. So this is um, the Hughes, this is the long list which you will have to read theoretically. I'm not going to enumerate each and every one. This is there in the book. I want to give you overview so that you don't get scared by looking at all these uh, so many names. So the newer way to look at these formulas are you can classify into a regression formula, versions formula, formula based on ray tracing, and formula based on artificial intelligence. This is the current way to look at these formulas. So for regression, we will have this SRKT. Remember, T in SRKT stands for theoretical. Then versions formula, you have Holiday 1 and 2, Hoffer Q, Hegis, Barrett, formula based on ray tracing, you have Olsen, and based on artificial intelligence, you have Hill RBF uh, uh, formula. RBF stands for radial basis function. Why so many formula needed? Because not a single formula can address all the issues. But if you ask me one, I will say Barrett because Barrett is not a single formula. It has evolved into a bouquet of formula, which includes Universal 2, True K, Toric Calculator, TK Universal 2, and TK Toric. After that, if you ask me one, then Hill RBF is evolving strongly. Now, make sure that the device, your device is compatible with the formula you use. Now, recently you see a lot of IL Master 500 is spread all over. This IL Master 500 will not measure lens thickness. So if you apply Barrett Universal 2 formula or Olsen formula on this, it will not work. So you will have to use something like Hill RBF formula. In Barrett Toric calculator, it, it takes empirically into account posterior cornea. Now, if you add TK value of IOL Master 700 to this formula, 
then posterior cornea will be considered twice and there will be overcorrection. So to avoid this, Professor Graham Barrett has developed two new formulae, that is Barrett TK Universal 2 and Barrett TK Toric. These things I am ignoring purposely because Dr. Sagar will be taking care of these special situation formulas. Again, I am bringing back to the very basic, you should remember SRK formula lifelong because this is the only visible formula. I talked about Barrett, I talked about Holiday. Did you see any number, any calculation? No. The SRK is the one which shows you the relationship between different components that we measure. And it should always be there. Whichever generation comes, you should keep it in mind. P is equal to A minus 2.5L minus 0.9K. It always gives you the importance, how much cornea is important and how much axial length is important. And then adjustment according to axial length is beautiful example of the regression, how data were analyzed and modifications were recommended for different axial lengths. This is one of the earliest example of this regression. Then you should also have idea of surgeon's factor, how Holiday realized that something we are lacking and then he advised to uh, take into consideration the distance between iris plane and the IUL surface. So from that time only they were trying to figure out something we are missing. Then again in, in Olsen formula also they try to uh, find out where the lens will sit. So what we were looking for, we were looking for the big answer, even if you measure cornea, even if you measure uh, axial length, the bigger question that where the lens is going to sit inside the eye, that still remains most challenging. That is why I showed you the surgeon's factor. And that is why I'm not now going to show you the C constant of Olsen formula. So if you measure the lens thickness properly, and if you, uh, you assume that lens is going to sit at the middle of that remaining uh, capsular bag, then your C constant will be 50%. So what they were trying to do, they were trying to find where the lens is going to sit inside the eye, and that is ELP. So, Holiday to what he did. He took into consideration more parameters to identify where the lens will sit inside the eye. He took into consideration seven variables that is, axial length, keratometry, horizontal white to white, ACD, lens thickness, pre cataract refractive error, age of patient. He, he never presented, uh, he never showed actual uh, calculations, but during his presentation in conferences, people captured uh, his slides and came to know that it was based on data of 35,000 patients from 35 centers. It was never published and initially it was charged some $300 per annum. Now it is, uh, I think, given uh, uh, with IOL Master 500, but that will not have lens thickness. So Norby et al. showed that uh, the prediction of ELP causes uh, the most common error in post-surgery uh, uh, residual refraction that is 35.5% and that ELP is still a challenge. So gradually we evolved from A constant to surgeon's factor to ELP and now this Hill RBF formula, what it is doing? It is artificial intelligence based formula. It is trying to recognize all the patterns of the eye available on this earth. Radial basis function, only the point of origin is fixed. Le rest is kept open. The data will be kept added to it, added to it, and, and we will recognize all sorts of patterns available. So from A constant to pattern recognition, the chapter is still open. So initially when I used to present, I will say, okay, for this uh, 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 axial length, this formula, this axial length, this formula, but now with Barrett Universal Formula and Olsen Formula and Hill RBF, these are more or less applicable across the eyeballs. So we have to switch over to um, uh, newer generation formulas um, and, and, and uh, um, uh, regarding special situations, Dr. Bhargava will be taking care of. 
Uh, so uh, at the end, what I want to emphasize that whatever measurement you take, you have to audit your results. Take into account, consider, reconsider the post op results, identify where the fault is lying, whether your machine is giving consistent error of 0.5 adapters or 0.25 adapters. So you have to identify that and 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 correct if intraoperatively there is a PCR and you are going to place the lens in sulcus instead of the bag, then you should remember to correct the IL uh, power. And, and on net, you will get this chart based on uh, the range of IL power, how much correction is needed to be there. So this is uh, an eye with axial length of 31.75 millimeter. I use same SRKT formula and, and, and I, I, I put minus one adapter uh, length and, and uh, on right side you can see uh, the result that it was minus 0.25 uh, cylinder only. So if you know the biometry well, you can come out with flying colors in various conditions. And, and this is the toric case I did 2.5 cylinder and this is the post op value. You can see what else you can ask for and all these are done without optical biometer with immersion only. So optical order of the day, if you don't have, you should do immersion biometry. You should make habit of doing it. So to conclude on one hand where we are trying our best to achieve post op emetropia, IULs are still available in steps of 0.5 diopters, which is called internal tolerance. So time has come to look into this aspect also, and we should pressurize the industry to reduce the steps of IOL powers available. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sujit, for that wonderful talk. Thank you. We will take some questions at the end. Uh, We'll move on to the next speaker now for today. This is Dr. Sagar Bhargav. He is a senior consultant at BBI Foundation, Kolkata, and he is the director in SLR Eye and Retina Surgeons Private Limited, Kolkata. Uh, he has many uh, gold medals to his credit in first MBBS and third MBBS. That, but there are more interesting facts I would like to you to know about him. While working in Shankar Netrale, Chennai, he was recognized as the best associate consultant in the year 2008 and conferred the TLK Row Endowment Award. In 2008, after successfully clearing, he was given the FRCS Glasgow uh, degree. He started the LASIK Center of Shankar Netrale, Kolkata in 2011 and was the first to use the Femto LASIK, bladeless LASIK uh, in East India. He has been actively involved as a speaker and panelist in many academic activities at state and national level. He has been a part of the team of conducting instruction courses at uh, ASCRS, which is a very uh, a proud thing for uh, India. Uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Sagar Bhargav has been associated with this program right from the beginning. He has been a speaker and a moderator also, uh, and he has presented before earlier also. We are very blessed to have him speak on biometry in special situations, which as postgraduates you will face from time to time, even after passing your regular practice also. I'd like to welcome Dr. Sagar Bhargav, please. Uh, thank you. Good evening, all. Am I audible? Hello? Yes, you are audible. Yeah, I, my screen is visible? Yes, full screen. Yeah, yeah great. So thank you very much, Dr. Satyajit, for this opportunity. Uh, uh, really, I'm very happy to be back again with another presentation. And hats off to you for uh, again, you know, doing this day, uh, this program, continuing this program. I wish when I was a postgraduate, I had something like this, what you have done for today's postgraduates. Anyway, now moving on to the topic, uh, I must really congratulate Dr. Sujit, to, uh, who has made my job very easy to explain the basics of biometry in such a nice way. So what I'll be essentially dealing with is when you are you know, faced with certain special situations, then what do we do? How do we approach these cases? The conventional way of uh, addressing these uh, situations may end up with errors. So let me start with first post-refractive surgery. Now, we all know that number of patients undergoing refractive surgeries are on the rise. And it is important that we understand this topic well because we need to handle these patients when they develop cataracts. 
So what happens is we use a conventional method for calculating the IOL. Let me start and uh, start by giving you an example. So this was a 46 year old uh, male who had an RK done uh, in both eyes about 18 years back, had a cataract surgery one month back and the IOL that was used based on the conventional biometric was plus five. Take a wild guess in your mind what exactly might be the refraction of that patient. But I can tell you one thing that the patient was very, very unhappy. So when he came to me, I saw that he had a best corrective visual activity of 6 by 18 with a correction of plus 8 diopters. So uh, that was the reason of his unhappiness. I, this is an after the surgery. If you get a plus 8 diopter, that's a big, big uh, surprise. So where is the problem? So, prob so the problem can be at the level of keratometry, at the level of axial length, at the level of formula. So let us try to understand as why this conventional method doesn't work in uh, in uh, post plastic eyes. So there is something called as a refraction index error. Uh, so uh, Dr. Sujit has very nicely said that this uh, conventional instruments are, uh, they use essentially a refractive index of 1.3375, which is a fictitious index, fictitious value. It, and it is, uh, it is based on the assumption that the anterior surface and the posterior surface of the cornea has got a fixed relationship or a constant ratio. But as we all know, when the, when you do a LASIK, it, it basically flattens the front surface. So this relationship no longer holds true. Though in RK, flattening happens in both the surface, so ratio is maintained. So this is the first uh, problem in the formulas uh, that we use. The second problem is uh, actually the formulation error. So uh, Dr. Sajid was mentioning something about ELP. So, so the third generation formulas, which are like SRKT, Holiday 1, and SRK. Uh, 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 so uh, the third generation formulas, basically, they use combination of axial length and keratometry, uh, keratometric corneal power to the effective lens position. Now, what happens after myopic correction is that the cornea flattens and the K value comes down. When you put this K value in the formula, the formula assumes that the anterior chamber is shallow because the K is less. So it will ask for a lesser power IOL, thus eventually leading to uh, hyperopic surprise in these patients. So to address this, uh, doctor, uh, there is something called as a double K Aramberry formula, which came up in 2003, which basically uses preoperative K to predict ELP, and it uses the present K, that is after LASIK, to predict the IOL power. We will see how it is used in the uh, in the slide. So you had based on this uh, three uh, double K methods: SRKT, Holiday One, and Hoffa Q. Now the third problem with these instruments is what is called as instrument error or radius error. So we know that keratometry measures at about 3.2 millimeters in patients like uh, who have undergone RK. Their area of flattening can be much lesser than 3.2. It may be just 2.5 or 2. So probably you will be missing the flatter zone if you are using these instruments and this can actually lead to a faulty IL power. So just to recapitulate, so if you have a myopic patient, myopic LASIK, you will have uh, only the front corneal surface which gets flattened. So the ratio is altered, but you have a wider optic zone. So the optic zone in LASIK is about six to seven millimeters. On the other hand, for the RK, the, the optic zone is small but the ratio between the front and the back surface is more or less maintained so what has happened in the last two decades is number of approaches have been de described which either modify the corneal curvature or they modify the refractive index or they or multiple new formulas have been formed so there are not less than 13 approaches that have been described or even more in the last two decades so how does one choose what is good and how does one approach this scenario? So uh, luckily, ACRS has made things a little easier for us and they have bought out all the validated formulas in one platform and they have given us a free access uh, for us to use it. So uh, basically, once you, you type this website, you are, you know, ask these things, whether the patient is pre-LASIC, pre-hyperopic LASIC or a prior RK patient. So, once you uh, click this, then the thing starts. So these are the three steps that you will essentially do when you are approaching this patient. Step number two, one is do a routine biometry. Optical will be preferable, but you can still do with the ultrasound biometry also if you don't have an access to optical, uh, that's fine. Note the K1, K2 and axial length. These three parameters are very important and, uh, and then do a corneal topography and then fill the data. So why corneal topography is required? Because corneal topography, will help us uh, to find out what is the area of ablation, whether it is central, 
or uh, whether there is a decentration of the ablation because that will help us to understand uh, the possibility of a surprise. Second, it will give you information on the posterior coronal surface, which will help us find out true net power. And thirdly, it will give you zonal K readings. That means the cornea is divided into multiple zones, starting from one, millim one millimeter zone to up to even eight, nine, uh, up to seven to eight millimeter zone. So yeah, basically, you are interested in first three or four millimeters. And it will also tell you how much is the area of flattening in RK patients. So accordingly, you can take that data based on the flattening. Now, look at this uh, slide. So here you can see the, gra uh, the graphs on the left side and, and actual topographical map on the right side. So if, I want you to look at this graph. So what you see here is basically in 4.4 millimeter zone of the cornea, this is the power distribution map. So what it tells me is that it's, a, it's like a plateau. Not many peaks are there. So basically it tells me it's, it's a pretty regular kind of an ablation. You can see a blue zone, which essentially tells me the area of flattening. Let's look at the next graph. Here you can see there are multiple peaks. Three, there are at least three peaks you can see. And you see the corresponding corneal topography. So the topography shows that there is some irregularity in the surface and these patients can have refractive surprise in spite of all the efforts that you take. Now look at this post-RK patient. Now post-RK, remember one very important point is that in there, uh, is, though I told you that they have a small area of flattening, but in that area of flattening also, they can have a wide range of power. So right from 30 to you know, up to 45, 50, you can have that. So which zones you need to take that will depend on basically the pupillary diameter and uh, and uh, and uh, the the areas where the, uh, the K is, uh, is high. So we'll see that. So one thing to remember is uh, in RK in general, the accuracy is lesser than post LASIK patients. So this should be very clear because cornea has a lot of multiple peaks. We call it as multifocality of the cornea. And there is a strong demarcation between the steep and the flat area near the pupillary border. So uh, there is a possibility that you might miss that flat area and you might just take a value from the steep area. So there may be a surprise. Also, there is something called as a diurnal fluctuation in the cornea. So you can have patients who can have hyperopia in the morning and he may be myopic in the evening. And that's the reason why early morning readings should be taken. And always you should aim for post-op myopia more than minus one because these patients will tend to have hyperopic shift uh, in the early post-op, even up to one to two years. So you have to make them high myopic. Now, uh, once we enter that ACRS calculator, we have to understand that the IOL power calculation is done with three strategies. First strategy is when patient's past history is known. That means you know the preoperative K and the refraction, the change that the patient has, under, uh, ha, has had. Second is what is the refraction change uh, that the patient had. That means there is no other history, only you know that the patient had a plus seven correction. So you know this data, this, with this you calculate. And the third approach is that no, no data at all. So this is the most commonly uh, 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 common approach that we take and uh, let's see what are the methods so the first uh, approach had uh, multiple methods of which clinical history method was most popular in fact it was considered as the gold standard but it fell out of favor because uh, the it, it relied on patients refraction preoperative and postoperative both are subjective uh, things and uh, postop can refraction can change as we know with the development of nuclear sclerosis so what if you don't have the pre-op K value, you only have uh, the surgical induced refractive change. So you have multiple, these approaches are there and these are all there in the ACRS calculator. Now here the principle is you change uh, what happens, what, what these approaches do is they either change the keratometric index or they modify the, to the K that is taken from the topo or they basically adjust the IL power after the, uh, the result has come out. But the most common approach that is used is a no history method. That means you don't take any value from what has happened before and basically use these uh, formulas and these methods for uh, for IR power calculation. So let's get back to the uh, to the to the uh, the ASRS calculator. So here you have to basically fill up the details of uh, the patient, doctor's name, I, uh, IL model. You have to write what is their target refraction. So if you have pre elastic data, you can enter here. Very important to understand if it's if the patient had only spherical correction, you have to write spherical correction, but you have to write zero in the cylindrical value. Otherwise, it will not work. The next is post plastic refraction. If you have the refraction values which are reliable, you can enter them. Otherwise, you can leave it. This is the point that you will be basically calculating. The topography point uh, which can be done on Atlas or Tommy or any other available uh, machine that you have. 
we do it on pentacam i'll show you how to do it and uh, once you have inputted this value this is the normal ultrasound or optical biometric data so this data you will enter the way you have got it from your biometric machine so you don't have to really in, uh, interfere with anything now what we enter from pentacam is basically true net power which is uh, uh, which is apex centered uh, 4 mm zone i'll show you that so when you order for a pentacam ask the optometrist who does the pentacam to give you what is called as power distribution map in this power distribution map this it should be apex centered and it should be zone so you are not interested in ring you are interested in zone and you have to basically look at uh, the 4 mm uh, mean value of uh, uh, true net power so this value is available and this is the value that you will take so uh, this this is both the same and this is what you will enter in this uh, this uh, segment and once you enter that uh, and click calculate you will get different formulas uh, showing different values so you will get average oil power you will get minimum oil power and maximum oil power so it's up to you what you want to take now uh, just to go a little deep into this so what it does is it basically uses double k holiday 1 shamas haggis ocd base and barrett true k now remember i told you about double k formula so double k formula is used in uh, one or two strategies here which i am just marking here and uh, out of this barrett true k is most popular shamas is more popular and haggis is more popular and uh, this is how you get the value now for rk patients everything is the same but here you enter what is called as pf pwr sf40 which is nothing but uh, pentagam uh, it it basically is the 4 mm zone which is centered on the pupil so as i told you uh, in rk pupil size is very important so you have to take the zone which is centered on pupil 4 mm is the value most common but if you feel that the pupil is small you can take 3 mm value and 2 mm value also so this difference you have to um, uh, remember apex and pupil okay so next we go to uh, now before even going to acrs calculator if you look at your machine carefully most of these machines have one or two formulas which are inbuilt in this machine for example il master has haggis l aladdin has these two formulas inbuilt so what you can do is for a start you can put post lasik uh, uh, calculate uh, option in the machine and you can get this calculate now some people don't want to do this calculation business so they do what is called as aphakic refraction technique where the patient's cataract is removed a aphakic refraction is done either on table or patient is taken outside and uh, maybe after a couple of hours the refraction is done and you e either multiply it by a factor of 2 or you multiply it by a factor of 1.75 and whatever value you get that's your il power now a new kid on the block is there which is called as ora system which basically does intraoperative wavefront abrometry and you get real time il power calculation right now it is still not fully accepted but it is something that one can look at now coming back to our case which i told you come you came with the il surprise now we did the acrs calculator uh, uh testing for him uh, calculation for him and we got a value of 21 diopters as against his uh, his power of plus 5 and the result was very good his uh, his uh, refraction values came to minus 1 with a minus 2.5 cylinder at 20 degrees and he was 618 n6 now I'll give you another example this was a patient who had our prk done uh, and the pre previous refraction showed minus 9 now we we did aladdin for this patient we didn't put anything we just meant, did a normal il calculation and see we got 19.5 but uh, we have not done a post refractive thing we have just done a normal calculation now when we put post refractive il calculation it gives me a value of 21 from camlin calosi and it also has shamas in built and it gave me value of 21.5 when we run acrs calculator you can see how closely all the values come about right from 21.313 to 22.56 so we finally choose uh, 21.5 and this was the refraction unaided was 69 and uh, the spherical requirement was very minimal so uh, so this this is how you can do a post refractive il power calculation coming in short to some other conditions silicon oil spill dye again a very common situation for patients who have undergone retinal procedure now in this case if you do an a scan you will assess, essentially overestimate the axial length because and you it will lead to a lower power of il and you will have an hyperopic surprise why is it so because for a scan you need this uh, this equation where the distance is measured by velocity into time now normal velocity for vitreous is about 1532 whereas when the oil is there in in c2 the velocity reduces to 983 with a 1000 centi stroke thing and with 5000 centi stroke it is 1040 so 
so this you have to remember so what what we can do is either you can measure it with the actual length with the normal vitreous uh, speed but you can apply in a correction factor of 0.71 or you can change the velocity of sound in the machine so most of the biometric machines come with this option where you can change to a silicon oil mode and reduce the thing but doing all this if you have an optical biometry this is the method of choice where uh, where you get a absolutely correct uh, actual length you can also do one thing is some patients like diabetic patients uh, who will need silicon oil in future you can always document their actual length value before the onset of cataract now when we do uh, cataract surgery for this patient there are two possibilities one we do it with uh, with sor that means oil removal in the same go in that case you don't have, you aim for a normal refractive target of say 0.5 but when you are uh, doing with silicon oil in c2 you have to aim for a minus 3 to minus 4 hyperopia because silicon oil itself acts like a negative lens so it will reduce the effective power of your iol and uh, will make it hyperopic so to avoid that hyperopia you have to make patient you have to use a little higher power target higher myopia now biometry in presence of retinal detachment now here the idea is that be better to do an immersion a scan in a supine position because uh, especially in, in patients who have macula of rd because there will be a fluid shift in that situation and you might get a better value but rd patients you will always have an issue with regard to uh, measuring a shorter axial length compared to the actual axial length in significant rd it's always better to take other eye axial length now what happens if you have certain macular issues like vmt we all know vitreomacular traction is a condition where there is a traction on the fovea and the the thickness increases so a normal thickness of say 200 microns will increase to 500 so you will obviously have a false shortening of the axial length if you are doing an a scan so in this scenario you basically measure the other eye uh, foveal thickness and the difference is what is added to the axial length and you you can get the uh, il power done now certain patients come in with aphakia so and they come for a secondary il uh, implantation so in that scenario uh, you have to do it in aphakic mode and the a constant will depend on wh where you are going to place the il so whether it's a is a sulcus fixated il it's a iris glow il or it's a acl the a constant has to be uh, carefully uh, taken note of and then uh, accordingly the iol has to be implanted now patients who come with uh, with pseudophakia probably an iol exchange or a pg black iol we optical biometry remains the, the thing of choice but if you have if you don't have optical iop or biometry you, ultrasound can still be done but you have to be aware that sound velocities across different uh, lenses is different so this has to be up, up, uh, be aware of and you have to apply the correction factor to the axial length that you get uh then there is something called as a secondary piggy back so sometimes uh, when you have an uh, surprise post cataract surgery surprise and you want to put in a piggy back il you can use the holidays refractive formula which is available in Hi uh, holidays consultant software most of us don't have that uh, you can use this equation which helps you in telling how much is the power that you need to do r is nothing but the so uh, now in bi biometry in fake implants now the most common implant is colamer you can see the velocity of that uh, implant is almost same as vitreous which is around 15 uh, 46 and uh, uh, other implants are more or less not used now so in that uh, a correction is to be done with the help of this equation so you don't have uh, basically what it tells me is that you need a conversion factor for this which is taken from this table and you need a thickness of the implant and you essentially apply this and you get the correct axial length so with the, with an icl in c2 there is hardly any change you can go ahead with the standard uh, measurement but for the other lenses you can use this now biometry in extreme short eye one thing that you have to remember is that axial length error of 1 mm in normal eye would just give about 2.5 surprise but in a short eye the the this gets magnified to 3.75 up to 4 up to 4.5 so getting the right axial length is of paramount importance in short lens uh, short eyes and you have to do an optical biometry wherever possible the formula of choice is definitely barrett universal 2 uh, hoffer's q to some extent and holiday 2 also can be used now a lot of times this uh, small eyes give you a power of 55 60 and uh, in india we can actually do a customization of this iol and get the iol made of, of the size but sometimes if that is not feasible then you can put 40 diopters of iol which is available highest value and the remaining uh, suppose it's 55 so remain 15 diopters can be put as a piggy back but you have to remember that you have to do in a sulcus adjustment because this lens will be sitting little in front so this sulcus adjustment is done based on the power 
uh, that you need to correct. So for in our case, it's 15. So you'll have to minus 0.5 from 15. So this will become 14.5. So we'll put a 40 diopter lens and a 14.5 diopter lens in the cell crest to give you a uh, correction for 55. In long eyes, the problem is posterior staphyloma and posterior staphyloma uh, increases uh, as the eye, uh, action length increases. And uh, in that, the problem is where does the fovea lie? So there is a lot of anatomical variation in posterior staphyloma. And if it's on the sloping wall, you may not get a good spike. That's where optical biometry comes in because it measures the visual axis, unlike the ultrasound, which measures the anatomic axis. So for biometry in long eyes, the, the three formulas that are mentioned is Wong Fox modification of axial length. This is IL master axial length or optical bi bi biometry axial length, bi Barrett's universal two uh, and Hill RBF, which can be done up to minus five. Uh, that's uh, what is the limit for that. Barrett's two also account for change of lens design from bifocal, biconvex to minuscule. Remember the lens uh, design changes as it goes towards minus power. So suppose you have a, a AMO lens, so from minus two diopters, its design is no longer biconvex, it becomes minuscule. And for, I think, Alcon, it's from uh, plus five itself, it becomes minuscule. So Barrett Universal 2, the highlight is that it accounts for this change in uh, thing, it's change in the shape, and it helps in uh, getting the power. So here you can see the actual length modification done by Wang Cox. So you get an optimized actual length. This is the actual length from Isle Master. You use this formula and get an actual length. Now in scarred corneas, we had done a class on topography. So in scarred cornea, topography is very important to understand whether you can make out two axes. I'll give you some examples. So this is a scar, linear scar on the cornea. It gives you a topography value uh, picture like this. And it's an absolute normal bow tie kind of appearance. This patient, uh, you can go ahead with whatever lens you want to put. More, we, we, a toric iron lens was put. Here you can see there is a slight skewing of one of the axes. So this also, you can use the same data for your IL calculation. But see this, this is a totally scarred cornea. And you will still get K1 and K2 from this, but it may not be reliable. So you can always take values from the other eyes in the badly scarred cornea. Keratoconus, mild form of keratoconus, surprisingly, SRK2 has been giving good results. So they advocate SRK2 in these cases, but in moderate, mild to moderate keratoconus, uh, when, the di when the K is less than 55, you can use actual K. But in severe keratoc keratoconus, you have to use standard K, that is 43.25. And uh, now uh, uh, one more addition has happened to the Barrett suit, where he has introduced keratoconus calculation along with the other things in his Barrett 2K formula. So one can use this also. So I would just like to sum up that this, this uh, special situation thing is definitely a rapidly evolving area. And you need to keep updating yourself with publications. Indeed, it's very satisfying if you get a very good clinical outcome and if it becomes predictable in majority of your uh, difficult situations. Thank you for your patient hearing. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Sagar. Thank you so much for that wonderful talk. Uh, as a pros graduate, I can understand uh, that uh, so many numbers, so many measurements, so many calculations, so many formulas may be sounding a little confusing for you. Uh, but uh, the good thing is that this uh, talk will be available on YouTube and as you finish your post-graduation and you go into um, your practice also from time to time, you can always listen to this talk and uh, brush up your uh, uh, biometry from time to time because it's something which is very important and you will, you will always need it. And there are some very important points with Dr. Sujit, uh, Dr. Kamaljit and Dr. Sagar Bhargav have mentioned here, which will be asked to you in post-graduate exam and which if you listen to this care, talks carefully again, you'll be able to answer those questions. Tomorrow we have with us Dr. Virendra Agarwal from Jaipur, who will be speaking on cataract and recurrent uveitis. Uh, we have Dr. Ravindranath from Dawangiri, who will be talking on the different viscoelastics that we use in cataract surgery. And one of the important things is fluidics in phaco emulsification uh, that will be spoken by Dr. Kumar, uh, doctor from Mumbai. So we have a... Uh, uh, list of uh, faculty which are of national and international fame like we had of today. Uh, so I want you to make the best use of it. We'll see you tomorrow again at uh, five o'clock. I'll just see if we have any questions for Sar Sagar. Why, uh, Sagar, why is so, ma so many names of Barrett formula, Barrett Truke, Universal Barrett?
Why yeah. are there so many names so, to the same formula? Yeah, 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 yeah. I'll, I'll speak about that. So you have to understand, Barrett universal formula is basically for virgin eyes. That means the eye has not been touched at all. So it's a normal eye. That's where you use Barrett's universal two formula. Whereas Barrett true care formula is basically for patients who have had LASIK, RK, or who have had keratoconus. So that is a calculator done for Barrett true care. And now you have Barrett true care TK which Dr. Sujit was mentioning, where, where TK values are available in, uh, which involves posterior corneal measurement as well. And that's where you use Barrett TK2K. So you, have, you, you need to basically qualify that. And it's not something to be very confusing because it's basically what you are inputting that gives you the name. Sir, is SRK and SRK T the same? Sujit can take that. No, both are different. Both are different. Both are different. Can, can you outline that? Yeah, basically, SRK was the, the formula I showed P is equal to A minus 2.5 L minus 0.9 K. So that was the original SRK. And, and, and uh, uh, then regression was added to it uh, to make it SRK2. And then SRKT added uh, the modifications at uh, SRK has actually a lot of modifications. There were cusp uh, defects and, and then physiological inherent uh, problems were there in SRKT, which later came on as T2 modifications and five drops corneal height concept was incorporated into it. So SRKT, just like Barrett of our time, SRKT was of that time. A lot of modifications were there. And just like next level, we had holiday, holiday one and then holiday two. So SRK and SRKT both are entirely different. What is the concept behind Hill RBF formula? Yes, sir. Hill RBF basically it the radial basis function RBF is radial basis function. So that is used in engineering and all basically. So what they do so the point, so the point of measurement is kept fixed and the distance beyond is kept open based on uh, uh, that. So what it will do, depending upon the kind of eye it is seeing, it will have a pattern recognition. So it is an ongoing thing, data will be kept adding on it. So that is why it is very important. It will recognize almost all kinds of patterns. It's based on artificial intelligence. Yeah, and so that brings me to the question of artificial intelligence. Yes. Okay, go ahead, Sagar. Yeah, just one point. It all depends on the numbers to get that pattern. So if if the if the particular combination of input that you are putting in in that particular formula, if the if the formula says it is out of bounds, that means it has insufficient data to analyze what you have put. So that is that happens frequently if you have extremes of uh, of uh, dimensions. For example. You are putting about 35 uh, millimeters of axial length, or you are putting up an axial length of around 16 millimeters. So that's an ongoing work. So as they get more data, it will keep enlarging. As I said, that beyond minus five, it doesn't give any power. So minus five to minus ten is again a zone where it is yet to uh, come up with. Second issue with Hill RBF is it's basically on a single machine right now. That is, if I'm not wrong, it's on the Lens Star with uh, with uh, uh, with one lens. I'm not sure. So. That is also one other issue with uh, Hill RBF. So only time will tell us whether, whether it you know it take, overtakes all the other formulas. But as of now, its performance probably is almost same as uh, 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 Barrett's Universal 2. Yeah, so that, that is what Universal I said. Which, yeah, yeah, Dr. Sagar very rightly pointed. I, I omitted many things because of lack of time. The power range is mentioned for Hill RBF that right now it is available, available up to this range of power only. So uh, you rightly said, as as we grow up, the data database will increase and we will be able to cater to larger vari varieties of eyes. So it is open-ended. That is what I said. It is open-ended. So where do you see uh, futuristic artificial intelligence coming into this uh, biometry in times to come? It, it, it has, sir. It has, sir. And then that pattern is a very important thing because it is not about straightforward measurement. We have already done a lot of measurement. We have highest accuracies available. But the problem is only by pattern, 
uh, you can identify, but uh, uh, because where media is opaque, then a lot of issues are there. If transparent media, then fine. If media is opaque, then a lot of you have to have some blind assumptions. Sir, is Michelson interferometer and partial coherence inferometry both are the same? Michelson interferometry is the basic concept. So in that interferometry, you have OCLI or other one, a partial coherence interferometry. The basic concept is Michelson interferometer only. Which is better, IUL master 500 or 700? Oh, no doubt, 700. <laughs> yeah, but this is a question from a postgraduate, so you have to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> no, see, you could have asked me which one is better, IL Master 500 or uh, Lens Star. A few years back when it was asked, means definitely Lens Star, uh, I feel. But once IL Master 700 is there, it supersedes all. Okay, one question is optical biometer acts on visual axis, question mark. I cannot understand this question. Uh, would you want to put on your mic and ask that question? Optical biometer acts on visual axis. Maybe the appro approaching answer to this is, in IL Master 700, we have that option of that whether it has uh, measured the fovea or not, that we can understand, that we can know. Uh, so that may be the one approaching answer. Like in IL Master uh, uh, 500, you don't know whether it has uh, fixated over fovea or not. But in 700, we have that option. So maybe that is what he wants to know. This is interesting. Uh, biometry in nystagmus. Any tips? Yeah, as I showed in my slide, means in optical biometer, it may be an issue. With uh, immersion, you have some advantage. Dr. Sagar, any comment on this? Yeah, yeah, I agree. Uh, I agree, absolutely. Uh, it's not possible to do an optical biometry in this time with patients. Immersion definitely can be done. And th th that's where the skill of the optometrist comes in. So when we talk about uh, contact biometry, the skill is a very, uh, a very important and the skilled optometrist can actually give you a good axial length also. So you just need one point uh, fixation and they are able to take the value. So mm -hmm. immersion definitely would be a preferred choice in this. But one, we, one thing we have to understand is that in uh, nystagmus, you are uh, essentially trying to get an axial length, but we are not really aiming for a for a 100% refractive correction because they are anyway having a very poor visual acuity. So you will probably not get a very huge refractive surprise. So the, you, there is a possibility that you will err maybe about one to two millimeters. That's definitely a possibility. So, is there any but, point in identifying the null point and then doing biometry in that position? Yeah, I, I, yeah that's also one, one uh, good approach that can be definitely done. That can be done, yes, that can be done. Okay, so I would like to take this opportunity now to uh, thank all the eminent speakers who were there today, Professor Kamalji, Dr. Sagar Bhargav, Dr. Sujit Mishra. Uh, I'm really very grateful to, for the time that you have put in making up this presentation, uh, for the time that you gave us this evening, for all the energy, for all the effort that you put in for the postgraduates. I would like to thank all the postgraduates who were here with us this evening. Uh, most of all, I would like to thank Professor Kamalji Singh uh, really from the bottom of my heart, sir, for giving us so much time uh, and your blessings uh, today. Uh, I look forward to uh, seeing all of you uh, tomorrow evening at 5 o'clock. Um, and we will all join tomorrow. Just a quick question for dense cataract immersion. Immersion is better or optical biometry is uh, better? I think uh, uh, immersion will be better in a very dense cataract. Uh, so we'll uh, finish this evening today uh, yeah. and we will, all of us will meet uh, tomorrow evening at uh, yeah. five o'clock. Thank you so much, uh, Kamalji, sir. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Sagar. Thank you Dom so much, Dr. Thank Sujit you. Mishra. Thank, thank you so thank much you. to Intas for bringing this all together. Thank you for some IC.
on by me. <laughs> thank you. Sure, thank you. Yes. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Manish ji. Thank, thank you, you Manish ji. Thank you, Intash, uh, for bringing this all together. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.